Hello, Mark here from Present Day Production, and today we're going to be talking about recording and miking a Leslie. So I've been playing Hammond for around 30 years and recording a lot of that time, doing live gigs a lot of that time, and I don't think I've ever, ever mic'd a Leslie the same way twice. There are as many ways to mic a Leslie speaker as there are polystyrene balls in a bean bag. The options are honestly limitless. You could, there's so many different mics you can use, so many different positions you can put the mic. So today we thought we'd go through three of the most basic kind of principles for getting a good sound out of your Leslie. Close miking, distance miking, and something I've never tried on a Leslie before, which is mid-side miking. So we've used mid-side a lot on string sections and choirs and something where you want a wide stereo image, but you want to make sure you've got mono compatibility. Never actually tried it on a Leslie. So we're going to try that today and see how we get on. So first off, let's talk a little bit about the Leslie speaker and exactly what it is. Now, Leslie is traditionally partnered with a Hammond organ, a B3, a C3, an A100 being the big classics, and there's lots of other smaller spinet models designed for home use, and there's lots of different models of Hammond. You can also put a modern day Hammond through a Leslie, so you something like a XK3 or an XK5 or a Nord or something like that, you could put through um, a Leslie speaker to get a more realistic Hammond type of sound. You could also, using a preamp pedal, put a guitar through a Leslie, a Rhodes through a Leslie. Uh, John Lennon famously sang through a Leslie on many Beatles records. There's all sorts of things. If it makes a noise, somehow you can put it through a Leslie. I've put a sax through a Leslie before and it's got its own kind of unique sound. It's very, very difficult to reproduce digitally. So there's really great Leslie plugins in Logic and, and there's lots of different modeling effects you can get, but none of them sound quite the same as the real thing. It's something about the air around it and just the fact that it's a mechanical beast. No two Leslie's sound the same. And just trying to replicate that digitally is very, very difficult. So there are really two types of classic Leslie speaker. If you're in America, the one you'll most commonly encounter is the 122. And if you're in the UK or Europe, the one you'll most commonly encounter is the 147. They're basically both the same. There's a few technical differences between them, a few differences in speed switching and, and balanced versus unbalanced input. Um, I personally prefer a 147 because I think they sound slightly brighter. Um, but they're both basically the same. So they consist of a top spinning horn, which takes the treble component of the sound, and a bottom spinning bass rotor. The bass rotor has a speaker firing down into it and an angled baffle inside that spins either slow or fast, depending on what position you've got the switch in, and the same with the horn. They both spin in opposite directions, so the reason, main reason for this is to stop the cabinet wobbling itself to death when you switch it on tremolo or fast speed, um, and that makes the sound even more complicated for digital modeling technology to reproduce because both the horns spinning in opposite directions give you the effect of pitch changing and also the amplitude changes as well and you get a true tremolo out of it but it's very difficult to replicate. So for today's little experiment I've, I've got a 145 over there which is basically the same as a 147 but slightly shorter. They're kind of classic valve amps um, and again the 122 had a classic valve amp in it as well. Today we're going to use this beastie, Larry, which is actually a solid state Leslie. It's a model 760 and in my opinion it's one of the most underrated and underused Leslies out there. This sounds just like a 147 but about twice as loud. So when I'm doing a gig I tend to take this beastie because the Leslie valve amp is a 40 watt amp and it just gets lost because the sound's thrown 360 degrees out of the cabinet as well. The sound just kind of gets lost. As soon as you get a drummer going and a bass player going, all of a sudden what was really loud in the studio, you just can't hear on the stage anymore and you need to start putting it through monitors and stuff like that. So I gig with a 760 because they're loud and the amplifier was designed to break up and distort in the same kind of way as a valve amp. So if you're on a budget, you can pick one of these up for about a quarter of the price of one of the classic valve models. And to my ears, they sound every bit as good for live use, a little bit better. So first off, let's have a look at the close mics. 
they're quite close. In fact, they're almost in what is technically the back of the cabinet. Now, the classic valve Leslie's have louvers um, all around them and a, a panel on the back, which most people take off because they like to see the, the stuff going around. Uh, I never tend to mic the louvers. I generally tend to take the back off when I'm close micing and get those mics in there. Um, it's always a balance between picking up the sound of the organ and picking up the wind noise you get when you put the rotor on a fast tremolo speed um, and the mechanical noises of the switching and stuff like that that come through. But to me, if I hear that on a record, I know that they're using a Leslie and it just, it's, you know, you hear that sound in the room, it's part of that sound. It's all, it's just all part of the thing. If some of the digital modeling devices added that kind of that you get and some of the clicks and pops and farts and other things, then I think they'd sound better. So the close mics we're using, Two SM58s. I've used SM58s a lot. I've used SM57s a lot. The reason I've used 58s today is because they've got the basket on the front, which has got a foam windshield in there, and it just keeps a little bit of the rotor noise down. Also, our SM58s, uh, sorry, our SM57s are from very different eras and sound very different. I haven't got two SM57s that sound the same, whereas the 58s sound more closely matched. These two always kind of work well as a pair. So we've got two SM58s right in there, picking up all the action. And then on the bottom, we've got a Rode NT1A. The Rode NT1A covered many times in our previous videos is a large diaphragm condenser and it's supremely versatile, great at picking up just about anything. I've used U47s on the bottom of Leslie cabinets, various other large diaphragm condensers, uh, ribbons, dynamics, large diaphragm dynamics, so something like a Shure SM7B or a Electra Voice RE20, they can work as well. Tend to get a little bit less volume out of the dynamics. They can be quite difficult to, to get sounding right, whereas the large diaphragm condenser just tends to pick up the sound as it is coming out of the cabinet. In the mix, if I'm doing a rock track or something with a band that's got a bass player in it, I'll very rarely use a lot of low mic it just tends to muddy things up it just all starts to sound a bit mushy so i tend to favor the two top mics so once again two sm58s on the top and we've got a rode nt1a on the bottom that road sounds great so we're going to leave it there to explore the other mic setups so another common technique used for sometimes a more jazzy approach or a more natural sounding approach but it was actually the way that they recorded the classic stevie winwood tune give me some loving is a more distant microphone approach so in this case we've got two of these microphones these are medium diaphragm condensers so they're quite unusual in that they've got um, 18 millimeter capsules which is somewhere in between small diaphragm and large diaphragm and they're also aluminium capsules as well these microphones are great if you want a natural sound we've used them on choirs we've used them on string sections we've also used them as tom mics on a more jazzy kind of kit they're great natural sounding microphones these are spaced about three foot from the leslie we've got one on the right hand side here and one on the left hand side over the other side so the less is in the middle we've got the two microphones facing each other so they're picking up the top rotor and they're picking up the bottom rotor as well there it's about halfway down the cabinet so it's picking up the top and the bottom in kind of equal amounts that gives you a little bit less control over the base end but it's nothing a little bit of eq in the mix won't sort out so the third technique we've used today, and this is a technique I've used on lots of other sources, but never before on a Leslie, is the mid-side technique. Now this consists of two microphones. You can see here we have two microphones. The bottom microphone is a ribbon microphone, and that has a figure of eight pattern. The top microphone is a small diaphragm condenser, and that has a cardioid pickup pattern. Now this is important. If you're using the mid-side technique, and I'll explain briefly about this, we're gonna do another video on, on mid-side miking, but just to give you a very, very brief overview, the ribbon microphone picks up your stereo image. So because this is a figure of eight pattern, it's picking up sound equally from this side as it is from this side. The small diaphragm condenser, because it's a cardioid microphone, is just picking up sound from the front. So the trick with this microphone technique is to have one cardioid microphone and one figure of eight microphone. That can be a ribbon like we've got here, or it can be a condenser, doesn't really matter. I prefer the sound of a ribbon because they naturally exhibit a figure of eight pattern. So the top microphone is a cardioid, in this case, a small diaphragm condenser. Again, it doesn't have to be, it could be an SM57, SM58, anything with a cardioid pickup pattern. 
The bottom mic is our ribbon, which has got a figure of eight pickup pattern. Now the cardioid microphone is just going to pick up a mono or mid signal from the Leslie. So it's pointing directly at the top of the speaker and that's going to pick up our mono or mid signal. The ribbon microphone, because it's figure of eight, that's going to pick up sounds from the sides. So that's our sides microphone. Now this is a trick that was developed years ago um, for giving you a great stereo image when listening in stereo, but making sure that you're 100% mono compatible. So you'll know if you've watched our phase video that when two identical signals are, it, when one is inversed in polarity and they're 180 degrees out of phase with each other, they completely cancel out. So with any stereo recording, any recording where you've got more than one microphone, you can encounter phase issues and you need to make sure that you don't have phase issues. So obviously back in the day there was AM radio, which was mono and then FM radio came along, which was stereo. People would listen to stereo speakers in their home and then they'd listen to a mono speaker in the kitchen. So mono compatibility was hugely important and still is with a lot of people listening to things on iPhones and single, single speaker sources these days. So basically what you do is you record the cardioid microphone as normal and then you record the figure of eight microphone twice. So easiest way to do that is to record it once and then just duplicate the recording. So cardioid microphone on one channel, figure of eight microphone on the second channel, then duplicate the second channel along with the audio. So you've got two identical audio recordings from this microphone. Back in the day, we used to do it through a desk with what was known as malt the signal. So you'd have one XLR going into your desk and then you'd split that off into two channels on the mixer to get the two identical signals. These days it's much easier, you can just replicate the audio file in your DAW, copy it and you've got your two channels. What is then hugely important is to reverse the phase of one of those channels because if you don't you'll just get another mid signal. You can pan them anywhere you like but you'll just get two identical signals so they're always going to be in the middle. So you reverse the phase of one of the channels on your figure of eight microphone and what then happens is you can vary the volume between the cardioid microphone and the two figure of eight channels so keep the two figure of eight channels at the same volume at all times always have those the same you can pan them you can pan them 20 20 40 40 you can pan them hard left and hard right whatever sounds best to you now the because these two channels are out of phase it'll sound really weird on its own but then when you bring the mid microphone back in that will bring the phase coherency back into normality and very difficult to explain but basically what happens is because you've got two identical signals that are 180 degrees out of phase with each other from this microphone if someone's listening in mono this microphone will completely cancel out and they'll only hear the signal from this microphone does that make sense I hope so. We're going to do a mid-side recording and talk a bit more about mid-side recording and mixing techniques as well in another video. So we'll save all the technicalities for that one. But suffice to say, I've never actually tried recording a Leslie like this before, so I'm quite interested to hear how the results will sound. So I've made a rare excursion into the live room and recorded some Hammond. I've recorded it over a backing track. So the track is my band, The Get Up. Um, we recorded a version of Hush um, for an album a couple of years ago. So I've played some Hammond over that because I want to try and, rather than just having this really exposed, I want to try and listen to how the different sets of microphones sound and then actually kind of hear it in context in a mix rather than just me playing some chords or something like that on its own. Obviously what style of music you're recording, so in this case it was Hammond organ, what style of Hammond you're playing uh, will largely dictate the way you decide to mic up the Leslie so if it's if it's more of a jazz based thing you're going to want some extra low end and there's plenty of engineers I know that instead of micing up the rotor on the bo bottom of the Leslie on the bass end they'll actually put a microphone on the bass pull on the back of the speaker because then you get a more consistent bass sound so if you're doing pet you're playing pedals or you're playing left hand bass then you might want a more consistent bass um, again a lot of people unplug the rotor so the, the bass rotor doesn't actually spin at all um, and then they'll line it up with the, the baffle with the microphone to get the most bass out of the Leslie. I haven't done that with, with um, I'm, I'm guessing I'm hardly going to use um, any of the bass mic because it's just going to muddy things up but 
Let's have a look at the three different sets of microphones, have a listen and see how they sound. So I've already set up the matrix for the mid side pair, but we'll come back to that in a minute. Let's keep things simple first of all, and let's have a listen to the 258 and the Rode NT1A on the bottom. So we'll play a bit of track. Let's bring the Hammond in. So it's just a little bit of reverb on there. I haven't, I haven't EQ'd anything, I haven't compressed anything. It's just a little bit of reverb and that's it. So that's my go-to Hammond miking technique. Couple of dynamics on the top, large diaphragm condenser on the bottom. Uh, that gives me options for the mix. If I want a mono Leslie sound, I can just use one of the dynamics and mute the other one. If I want a stereo sound, then I've got the two mics and I can pan them a bit and, and widen it a bit. So quite familiar with this sound. That sounds like my Hammond. It sounds like that Leslie. Um, quite happy with that. If, you know, in a mix, I'd do very little processing to that. Maybe a little bit of compression, perhaps bring a little bit of the top end out just slightly, maybe cut a bit of the low, but it, it fits in quite nicely, quite happy with that sound. Let's just hear it on its own, just so you can hear the difference between the three sets. So we'll take the track out. Apologies for the awful playing. Actually, let's, take, let's just take the reverb off all together for a minute and we'll just hear the raw sound. So you can hear a bit of a, you can hear a bit of wind noise, you can hear you can hear the rotors spinning, um, you can hear you know mechanical noise and stuff like that and like i said earlier i, I like that it you know it's a leslie it's an actual mechanical thing so to have all those noises in there great you know that's the if that's the sound it makes then that's that's the sound it makes um so quite happy with that quite familiar with that let's move on now to the the white the, the the sort of far mic so we had the two tm80s one left and one right so this is just two microphones um i'll just keep it soloed for the moment just so as we can hear the difference a little bit more clearly so let me play that one so this is the two sort of far further out mics about three foot each side from the cabinet and I've panned all these hard left and hard right so you can so you know please listen with headphones on or through a decent set of speakers to kind of really hear the difference again kind of what I was expecting I'm I'm not a fan of miking things like this too far away um our live room's very neutral so i don't really need to get any room sound because there isn't any room sound it's a it's a really neutral fairly dead sounding room so you know i'm not worried about i'd never put a, a room mic up if i was recording the the leslie for example and rarely do i do i put up room mics for drums unless i know that i want to specifically crush them after the fact or add some ambient reverb or something like that uh, let's just go to the end of the track because it gets a bit more lively and we'll compare the, the close pair with the pair that are further away. So these are the two TM80s. Let's switch over to the 258 now. Wow, much, much brighter. Let's just put the bottom mic in on those. Again, so this is these are the this is the 58, and the TM80. So there's there's more low end in there. Prob it sounds it sounds more like the Leslie does in the room. So let's hear that in context. Let's hear what that actually sounds like in the mix. Let's just go to a little break where the Hammond comes in. Okay, so 
so that's interesting so between those two in the context of this track i'd go for the close mics because i'm going to have more work to do when it comes to mixing to get the two tm80s to sit in the mix better the 58s all i've got to do is push the faders up and it's there so that's you know a, an ideal scenario that tm80s are gonna they're gonna take a bit of work to to get them to sit in the mix so in the context of this track um so far the, the 58s win for me but now the one i'm really interested in which is the mid-side pair so let me just show you what i've done here so we've got the small diaphragm condenser which is on its own all right let's just take the track out So that's the small diaphragm condenser on its own. Let's get the ribbons in. So these are the two ribbon tracks. Now, so what we've done is there's, obviously there's one cable coming out of the microphone. It's a figure of eight microphone, but there's just one cable coming out of it. So it's just one signal coming out. So we've duplicated the signal in Logic. And then on the duplicated signal, I've put the gain plugin on and just inverted the polarity. So this is 180 degrees out of phase with that so if i play the two hard panned left and right if you've watched our phase video and you've kind of become a bit allergic to the sound of something out of phase this will probably make you go Ugh! like that i hope so anyway this should sound quite horrendous yeah it's i mean I, i'm listening all bit very quietly because i don't want feedback into the microphone but i'm listening through the main monitors in the control room now and all i've got to do is move my head a little bit and it's just uh, yeah that's quite horrible if i mono that signal then what should happen is we should completely lose everything so we should just completely lose the signal let me do that on the hammond track i'll just turn that from a so I've, I've basically sent all the microphones to one bus let me just switch that to mono yeah gone so we can see it's still coming through it's still in the meters but there's nothing coming up on the output let's just switch that back to stereo again and we can hear it again albeit out of phase now this is where it starts to get interesting let's just go to a, to a different part of the song so when we bring the small diaphragm condenser in then that starts to correct the phase relationship wow so that actually sounds great that's really deep it's got that i think i might have just found my new favorite way to record a leslie um okay let's put the track in and, and listen to how it sounds in context So we can vary the stereo width by different combinations of the figure of eight microphone, the sides signal and the mid signal. Um, if you look at the screen on Logic, you'll see that I've linked the two sides microphones together because we always want those two at the same level. So, so, so the two figure the two figure of eight the side signal always wants you always want to have those faders at the same level um and then the small diaphragm we can we can vary independently um so let's just have a little play with the balance and see see what we get so if they're up kind of like that you're going to get full sort of width now because we've got the side microphone in let me just solo the hammond if i now mono it we can still hear the Hammond because now the sides mic, the two signals have completely cancelled themselves out, but we've still got the we've still got the the mid microphone. Back to stereo again and we get our stereo width back. So hopefully that shows how mid-side recording is a great 
method to consider if you want a, a big wide stereo recording but you need to make sure you've got a hundred percent mono compatibility because with mid side recording if you get it right and let's face it it's not that hard i've got it right today and it's the first time i've ever done it on a leslie um the the stereo signal will just disappear it'll just cancel itself out you're not going to get you know it's not going to start cancelling out other instruments weird things aren't going to happen it will just disappear and you'll just be left with the mid the mid mono mic so it's a great recording technique for that uh so that's actually quite surprised me because i quite like the sound of that um which yeah i'm gonna i'm i'm gonna do that again next time I've, I'm doing a session and I've got some time in the studio and I'm recording a Leslie on my own and you know there's not a client here and it's not sort of time pressured and, and the clock's not ticking then I think I'll probably try setting the, the microphones up as we have done today again if it's a rock track or a funk track or something like that I won't bother with the, the far pair um, I'll just put a couple of 58s up um, a large diaphragm condenser on the bottom. I'll do the figure of eight ribbon with a small diaphragm condenser on the top. I'm feeling the ribbon, again, as you'd expect, is a little bit darker. Let's take the track out. Let's just compare the, the sound of the ribbon with the 58. So let's just put a little bit of reverb on again. Make sure we're in stereo. Yep, we are. So that's our that's our mid side combination, and then we'll go for the 58s. Actually, let's put the put the large diaphragm. Let's put the road in on the bass end. In fact, let me just so, let me just solo that mic. So this is just the mic on the bottom of the Leslie. So it's adding something. It's adding low end. That's that's where the low end of the organ's coming from. Uh, so if you don't need the low end of the organ, you need hardly any of the mic. If you're playing left hand bass or pedals and you need that low end, then then that's where you get it from. Funnily enough. Uh, so let's leave that in um, because that's just you know it's just filling it out nicely. Let's have a listen to the mid side combo. Let's go to the 58s, the closed mics. Okay, so the ribbons are a little bit louder. Let's just bring those down a bit. Good, strong one. Okay. Let's bring those. So this is the mid-side pair. Let's bring them up a little bit. Back to the 58s. So the 58s are a bit brighter, or the ribbon's a bit darker, whichever way you look at it. That's what I'd expect. Quite often with the ribbon mic, you need to crank the top end a little bit to get that sparkle through. We're also getting the tre so the actual tremolo. If you can hear the tremolo, the, especially the amp, the change in amplitude when that horn spins around, um, we're getting more of that. That's more pronounced with the close mics whether a little bit of compression will bring them you know closer to each other remains to be seen in fact let's right okay let's do that let's let's perform an experiment so what i'm going to do because if you've seen a lot of our videos you'll know that i don't really give a toss what microphone i use on what i mean you know i could have 58s on the top of the leslie i could have a couple of of anything i just don't care um it's just EQ at the end of the day, really. Um, and we did, if you've seen the interview we did with Sean Lee, one of my favorite ever Sean Lee quotes was when I asked him what was his favorite go-to mic for a guitar amp. And he just said, oh man, it doesn't matter. Just that one, which one's closest, go play. And that's that just sums it all up. It really doesn't matter. If you've got a guitarist in the room and they're ready to, to go, stick anything in front of it. Um, you know, as long as it's not horrible and you don't get it the wrong way around or anything like that, it doesn't really matter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the TM80s out of the equation because they're just too far away from the Leslie to get that sound that I really want for the track. So I'm going to mix two versions of this um, using 
what basically we're left with is two radically different miking techniques. We've got a close spaced pair on the Leslie and we've got a mid side pair on the other side of the Leslie. I'm gonna EQ the mid side pair to sound as close as I can to the others. So I'll get both sources sounding as near as I can and then I'll get James to label them. So we'll do, I don't know, a chorus of the song and then the same chorus of the song. So it's the same, the same bit of the song. Again, with the, with the track in, because you know, this is, we're trying to get the Hammond to sit in with the track. It's, that's what it's about. Um, I'll get James to label them so as I don't know which one's which, and then we'll see if you can hear the difference and whether I'm, hopefully right or whether i'm just talking a complete load of rubbish and it really does matter what microphones you use but i'm fairly confident on listening to these two radically different microphone techniques with radically different microphones i'm fairly confident i can get them sounding so close that i won't be able to tell which one's which so let's do it and we'll find out So here we are again, uh, I've got James with me. I've been down the pub. I thought it would be a good idea to let him do the mixing because then I can just get be a bit detached from it and give me ears a break uh, and listen to some people moaning about uh, Brexit and other stuff. So I went down the pub for an hour and um, James mixed the track. Um, I'm back, slightly drunk. And um, yeah, how did you get on? Yeah, so it's uh, a very simple mix. Didn't take too long to do, but basically I've tried to match the two sets of mics as closely as possible so we can do this test. So just to show you what the setup is, um, basically we've got two sets of mics that we're comparing. So we've got the SM58 pair, and that's paired with the Rode NT1A on the base end. And basically I've set up two buttons so I can switch groups on and off like that. So that's the ASM58 group. And then the other group is the mid side. So you've got the ribbon mic, which we duplicated to give it the out of phase property and the small diaphragm condenser with it. And then the road on the base as well. So basically what I can do is just switch between those two like that. And we should or should not hear a difference depending on how good our ears are, how good yeah. the mix is. We'll see, see what happens. So you've just duplicated the bass channel with the Rode mic in order to be able to treat them as two sets of microphones. Because yes. if you were recording with the close mics, you'd be using the 58s and the Rode. If you were recording with the mid-side combination, you'd be using the ribbon, the small diaphragm condenser, and the Rode. Yeah. And that might need mixing differently yeah. in the combination of yeah. whatever group you're in. Cool, that makes perfect sense. So just to cover what I have done, so we can get a, an idea for how it's been treated. There's no massive mix that's gone into this, very simple. So a tiny bit of compression on the SM58s. Um, they're very dynamic mics and there is some volume difference audible uh, from the tremolo of the, the spinning horn on the Leslie basically. So a bit of compression just to smooth that out. Uh, and I've darkened them slightly. I've taken a bit of the treble off of the SM58s um, to kind of match the ribbon a bit more closely. On the ribbon, I've done the opposite. I've added some treble to brighten it up and I've kind of tried to meet the mics in the middle, basically. So one's darker, one's brighter and met them in the middle. Uh, and I think they sound pretty, pretty similar. Cool, well, that'll be interesting to find out. Um, yep. So when we were listening to the listening to the first off, I thought the 58 sounded better. I in context of the track, I thought they just, all you had to do mix wise was just turn the faders up. And that was it. They didn't really need any EQ. They didn't certainly yeah. didn't need any compression or anything like that. Um, so, <clears throat> but if you've got them close together, it will mm. be interesting to see how they compare. And this will this will prove two two points. If it really is that close, uh, point number one is which is something we keep just harping on about all the time, which is. Um, it doesn't matter what microphones you use, as long as they're not rubbish microphones that sound awful on everything, it doesn't matter. Just get a mic up and play. That's that's what matters. Um, and the other, if you can get them that close, the other thing it proves is how good at mixing James is, which is, you know, if you can get, because not only are they two different, it's not a shootout, it's not an AB between one microphone and another microphone, it's, two different sets of microphones, but it's also a completely different recording technique. The So to go from a 
what's effectively a spaced pair, which is a 258 on the back of an open Leslie cabinet, yep. to a mid side pair, which is a <coughs> figure of eight ribbon, half of which is out of phase with a cardioid pencil in the middle. That they're com two com they're not just different microphones; they're two completely different recording techniques, yep. completely different. They're co sort of in terms of stereo recording techniques, they're about as opposite as you get. Um, so it'll you know it'll be interesting to hear the difference so shall i shut up and we can just have a listen and just for 15 seconds so just to <laughs> show you what we're going to be doing there's two projects basically this one as i say we've got the two different blocks of microphones the mid side and the 58 groups um in this one obviously because it's on the screen we can hear and see what's going on we can see what mics are in action i think that will color what we can see uh, sorry what we can hear mm. because I've listened back to this and I can hear a difference when I've got that on the screen. I can hear a difference when I know what mic is on. However, if I close my eyes or I've made a second project that does it for me, switching between the two, I can't tell the difference. So this is something worth noting that it, it does happen. What you can see on the screen does color what you can hear. So hopefully this will prove that. Never know. Maybe it won't, but I think it will. Okay. Well, I haven't heard it yet. Let's so give let's, it a go. Let's, let's, let's have a listen. Let's see how close you've got them. <laughs> Okay, right, stop there. <clears throat> so there were loads. Of, so there's a couple of things there. I'm I'm convinced I could hear the difference on the intro when when we just heard the organ with just the counting that the drummer was doing. Yep. Um, I'm pretty convinced I could I could tell the difference like that yep. between those two. And I'd agree with that on the intro. When we got in a little bit later, there were things that were clouding. So if you didn't quite hit the two solo buttons at the same time, there was a bit just a momentary millisecond where you get both tracks coming through yep. and that just told my brain that was something was switching over and then I could hear it. Yeah. But when you didn't do that, when you got it just, I mean, it's really, you, you know, this is under MIDI control, so it's really difficult to get it spot on. But there were a couple of times where it was spot on and I was quite, mm. I was like, oh, oh. Mm. Um, I think sometimes where you're changing chords as well, some of the chords are brighter than others and I think that might possibly cloud the the judgment yeah. which is why we've made the other project so should we go over to well, that just first off just play the intro with the with the 58s and then stop and play just the intro again with the ms <laughs> Slight difference. Yeah, there's a difference in stereo imaging, mm. which I'd expect because yeah, um, the, for me the midside sounds wider. Dar is it, it is still darker, even though I've tried to match the EQ. It's slightly darker on that solo part there in the intro. Yeah, but you're right about the stereo imaging. It's, it is wider, yeah, but that that is because of the mic technique. Exactly. Well, yeah, and, and it also sounds a bit. It's got. It's almost three. Di it's a bit more three dimensional. Yeah. As well. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's go to the let's go to the blind test because I mean, what I'm really interested in is how it sounds in the context of a mix. Okay, so as we can see on the screen, what we've got here is I've basically done a full bounce of that last project we were in. The top one is one set of the mics. The bottom one is the other set of the mics, and both are playing with the backing track. Now, Mark doesn't know which one is which. I know which one is which, and I'm going to see if Mark can tell. Now, what we were saying about our eyes colouring our ears for the what you can see is what you hear kind of thing, if I look at this, I can hear the difference. However, if I close the window down and play it, I can't tell the difference. Maybe in the intro again, it might. It might. I haven't actually tried it on the intro for this, so it'll be okay, interesting cool. to hear. But <clears throat> so I'm going to close the window as well so I can't see it. But on the edit for the video, I'll put A and B on the screen so you can hear. And then afterwards, maybe if you think that might have been colouring your, your, what you're hearing, 
play the video back, close your eyes, and try again, and see if you get the same results, or see if you then cannot hear what the difference is. We'll probably we'll, we make the files available for download and as we'll well. Do that so as well. if you go to presentdayproduction.com forward slash something, there'll be a link on the on the homepage, or, or just you'll see lots of our other videos on there. Just find this one, and there'll be a link there to the file, so you can download. Um, the backing track with the band, and you can also download the, the logic um, projects. The, the just the we'll just do it as do it as bounces. Yeah, we'll do it as bounces. So you can so there'll be three tracks to download. There'll be the um, in fact, actually, let's just we'll just do each microphone maybe, so you can have a play around and you can play with yeah. the mid side configuration. We'll give you it all, and, all of it, all of it. You can have the whole thing. So okay, so so. <laughs> Um, yeah, so are we good? Yeah, so blind test. Yeah. So I'm going to hit play, and then I'm so basically, as you can see on here, I've I've cut the audio every two bars, but the song wasn't recorded to a click, so it's not actually two bars of music. It's just a random time, so you can't tell. Oh, it's been two bars. He must have changed the mic. It's not two bars of audio. That's cool. just easier for cutting. So let's have a listen and see if you can see if I can hear the difference as well. Two things. Firstly, congratulations. That's some pretty good EQ skills you've, you've got there because <clears throat> unprocessed, unprocessed, they were noticeably different. And there were elements I preferred to the 58s and there were elements I preferred to the MS. I preferred yep. the depth and the imaging of the MS, but I preferred the overall tonality of the 58s. Now, the, the, you know, these are really what are these Biodynamic DT 990s. They're pretty good, pretty revealing headphones. We've got thirty thousand quid's worth of monitors in the wall. Um, I'm quite happy to put my hand up and say I can't tell the difference. I cannot tell when those when that changes over. Now, bearing in mind, I know roughly when they happen. Obviously, not exactly because it's not to a grid or anything. I know roughly when the changes happen, and I couldn't hear it. Like I'm, I'm fairly confident in how accurate my ears are. But I would quite happily have mixed the entire album like that with it A being between mics. And I, I wouldn't, if you hadn't have told me, if I hadn't have done this and you hadn't told me that there's two different mics, I don't think I would have known. Snap, if someone sent me this now for mastering, I wouldn't be phoning them up going, what, what's going on with the organ? It seems that every. 3.7 bars it seems to yeah. you know like it's different takes or, I, or something I think even in the intro where we know that it does sound slightly different because it's more exposed I think that could almost in your brain be passed off as oh he's just changed a chord it's a dark I couldn't chord hear, well I couldn't hear it but, on the intro yeah either um, I think I maybe could but because I know it's there so this is about like previous knowledge colouring what you can hear as well but yeah in, in the actual song I could not tell it's no different and if it was, again, like you said, it's no different to me, to a different take. Yeah. It's not like you've used a different microphone technique halfway through a bar. It's no different to just if you dropped in. Yeah, um, exactly. And the Leslie might be spinning slightly different, at a slightly different speed. And I'm changing yeah. the draw bar settings quite a lot throughout the song as well, which um, is obviously affecting the sound massively. Um, so I think that goes, so that really goes back to a point, as I said earlier, that we keep trying to hammer home all the time. And that is just don't get hung up on gear. If, if you can, 
I mean, there's lessons to be learned. Like, don't fix it in the mix is another one as well, which is basically what you've done here. So yeah, try and get it, try and get it right at source. But don't think, oh, I can't, you know, I can't set myself up a drum room and record my drums because I haven't got any API preamps and I haven't got 15,000 quids worth of this and 25,000 quids worth of that. It doesn't matter. Just buy a set of sure drum mics, stick some mattresses on the wall and, you know, get recording. Just, just, it doesn't matter. And can I just say as well, obviously me, Mark and you guys in the audience know that there is something happening. There's a change and we're really looking for it. If you're just Joe Bloggs oh, you on iTunes you have thinking, no idea. oh cool, Hammond, yeah, awesome. You're never really, well, you wouldn't know that there's a change. I don't think that the difference is enough because it's been leveled as precisely as possible and EQ'd to match. I don't think if someone had told me that there's something changing, I would have noticed. That's a, that's a really good point. At no point ever in the history of music has someone gone, I'm not listening to the new U2 album because Bono didn't use a C12. That's never happened, ever, ever in the history of music, it, ever. It's something that we find quite a lot with some recording artists is, oh, I can't do this because this isn't right or that's right, but no one's going to know. You know, if it's such a small difference that you can only really find it if you're looking at the Logic project thinking, right, where's that mistake? Hmm, can I hear it? Can I not hear it? Someone listening at home on iTunes or whatever, Spotify, isn't going to hear it. It's as simple as that. Yeah. I mean, it, if it's a blaringly obvious mistake or, you know, a, a blaringly obvious change, then yeah, fix it. But if it's something like this, if I didn't know that this experiment had been done, I would have quite happily said that's the original track. Well, uh, and, and the band, the, the artist, armed with the knowledge that this has been recorded on two different sets of microphones. So this, just for context, this track has been released a couple of years ago, so we're not releasing this track, but, you know, rewinding. Um, if this had been how it's recorded, you could quite feasibly spend two weeks and several thousand pounds trying to either, either, either redoing the session and trying to capture mm. the same performance again, or trying to get the, if, if, so the Hammond and the Leslie's no longer in the live room. The Hammond's now there. If I go and wheel that back in the live room and set the set it up pretty much as we had it, that's gonna that's also gonna sound different. And I don't think that will sound any less different than the two completely yeah. different sets of microphones and completely different recording techniques. Mm. So again, that hammers that's still just it just hammers home that fact all the time. That's it. It just doesn't matter. Um, so if you've got all the way to the end of this video, and thanks for getting all the way to the end of the video, because I guess it's been a bit of a long one now, um, then sorry. But the answer to how do you record a Leslie, it doesn't matter. Just stick some microphones up in front of it and play the damn thing. It really doesn't. And I've, I've used, um, we did some stuff with James Taylor. And we used, so James Taylor's go-to microphones for the top of his Leslie AKG C C414s which are a great choice they're kind of the condenser equivalent of the SM58 if you like that you know it's a good mic with a bit of a mid-range boost great on vocals great on drum overheads great on anything where you'd put a, a large diaphragm condenser um, and every record he's made with those microphones that I've heard sounds incredible but if we'd have used 58s instead of those, that would still sound incredible and it would still sound like James Taylor and it would still sound like his Hammond. If we used two ribbons on those, it would still be incredible. If we used two pencil mics, it would still be incredible. If it doesn't, it just doesn't matter what no. it really it's it's it does matter so you know don't get the mics the wrong way round um don't get them out of phase with each other unless you're doing a mid-side thing and one deliberately needs to be out of phase you, you need to know the basic knowledge in order to not kind of make any mistakes um but it's amazing what you can do with a couple of sm58 really and they and that and it also hammers home the point about learning how to use the tools that are available for treating stuff afterwards, like EQ, learning how to use it properly. You can get any sound if you know how to use it properly. Yeah, well, and, and again, this is, so going back to Sean's point again as well of, you know, what's your favorite mic on a guitar amp? It doesn't matter, it's all EQ. That's kind of it. And that's it how a lot of the, like the, the, the Townsend Labs mic and the Slate VMS, and their small diaphragm condenser, whatever that one's called, which are modeling microphones, 
they're basically microphones um, so if you take the slate ones they've got a large diaphragm condenser and a small diaphragm condenser that have basically been designed to be as ruler flat response wise as possible they're just really neutral microphones and they then get fed into software which models different types of classic microphones. So you can have that mic sound like a U47 or a, a 57 uh, or an 87 or any kind anything. of seven, anything yeah. ending with seven. They should have called the mic seven, yeah. really, shouldn't they? I think they did. Um, yeah, no, they didn't. Um, and yeah, so and, and it is basically EQ. It's modeling, but you know, there's a there's there's other stuff other than EQ. Obviously, there's there's certain mics have dynamic range. And yeah, certain things. microphones have big fat transformers in them, and that tends to saturate the sound a little bit if you if you overload them slightly. Um, but that again, that's all stuff these days that can be done after the fact that's not to say that you should not care when you're recording and just throw the mics up anywhere um, get the best sound you possibly can at source when you're recording but if you can only afford a batch of sm58s that sh that just yeah. shouldn't stop you recording at all ever nope. just stick them in front of something and hit record does that make sense it does to me hopefully that makes sense so should we cancel that order for the U47s? Damn it. Damn it. So yeah, so there we go. So we're going to do, um, uh, thanks to David Hughes, who asked us to do this video on how to record a Leslie. Sorry if it's waffled on, again, really long, like a, like a long one does. Um, like a long one does? What am I talking about? This is why it's waffling on, because I don't know what I'm talking about. So um, yeah, let's wrap it up. We'll leave everything in the description below so you know where to find the files if you want to download them. Um, and then how are we going to reveal what was A and so, what was B? So I'm the only person, as I said earlier, I'm the only one that knows who, uh, which mic A and B is. So next week we'll do a video basically telling you which is which and we'll see who is wrong <laughs> and who, is, who right. is right. Have I got a guess as well? Yeah. Well, okay. could you guess now after hearing that? No. You couldn't? No. Not even a hint? If you listen if to I, any if the I, intro. If I really critically listen to the intro, I might be able to tell you, I might be able to, if I really critically listen to it. I don't know. So in that next video, I'll, I'll get Mark to do this when we finish recording, and in the next video, I'll tell you whether he got it right or wrong. I bet he'll get it wrong. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> so we'll see you then. We'll give it a go. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks Bye. for watching. Please subscribe. Any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If you want us to make a video for you on any particular subject, uh, then let us know and we'll try our very best. See you soon. Bye.